Uh, so, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I take my headphones off, you put your headphones on. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here, Madam Minister, distinguished guests, and so many health promoters. I don't think I've ever been in a room with so many health promoters at the same time, but that's a really great pleasure because you are the foundation uh, of the health system, I'm sure, here in Estonia. I've had the pleasure uh, to work with health promoters, community health workers, health extension workers, uh, in my work in global health in Africa, Latin America, and I can see the value and the significance for health promotion and a public health approach to health care. And this is really what I'm going to be focusing in, uh, in my talk this morning, looking at um, mental and brain health amongst older people and approaches to promotion, uh, prevention of dementia and depression, um, and also, importantly, the care systems that we provide for mental health for older people and how potentially those can be improved. Now, uh, I'm a psychiatrist. I work at King's College Hospital in London, uh, providing advice in the general hospital about the mental health needs of older patients. So that's my clinical work. Uh, for my research, I work in global health in lower middle income countries, but also in the European context uh, as well, looking at the mental health of older people. Now, I've called this slide the Holy Grail. What ideally would we want to be achieving? Really, we would like to change the trajectories of aging. As we grow older, all of us lose functional capacity in all the organs and the systems of the body, including the brain, progressively over time. And if we can change that trajectory, then as we live longer, we will live healthier. But we also need to bear in mind that just because we have physical health conditions and experience disability, that does not mean that we cannot experience value and meaning in our lives, live our lives well, and have well-being. And so we need to ensure that for older people with disability and needing care, that care is provided in a good way so that the impact on their social well-being and social participation is minimized. And we need to remember that while living longer is a great thing, as Dr. Hiroshi Nakajima, one of the past director generals of the WHO said, living longer on its own is an empty prize. What we need to ensure is that we add life to years, not just simply years to life. So that's the critical question that we're facing. And there are many challenges when we look at this uh, as far as older people are concerned. We did a series for the medical journal The Lancet a couple of years back looking at the burden of disease in older people. And we thought, well, how is this different from just non-communicable chronic disease in general? But there are many things that are different about older age. The first is that degenerative disorders, including stroke and dementia, begin to become quite prevalent and important in the older part of the population. Also, it's not just one chronic condition, it's often living with two or more chronic conditions, what we call multimorbidity, that makes the management of those conditions much more complex. The burden on the older person and their family on engaging with health services and often the out-of-pocket payments, much more expensive. Older people are much more likely to be living with disabilities uh, and also occasionally needing long-term care. And this is where most of the cost within the health systems and within the social care system arises. Older people often experience, uh, uh, live in a fragile situation. Even in countries like Estonia and my own country, where there's a lot of social protection for older people, um, older people as a class are more likely often to be living in poverty and also to lack, perhaps, social protection from their family, uh, to live alone and to have limited support. Older people matter because that's where most of the societal costs are arising for health and social care, and yet they're underserved. We have too much ageism in our health services, where because people are old and for no other reason, 
uh, they are declined access or access is more difficult. So access to effective and age-appropriate health care um, and attending to the long-term care needs of older people, these are critical issues for our societies. Now, where do mental and neurological conditions, disorders of the mind and brain, fit in as far as the overall burden of disease of older people are concerned? And these are data from our Lancet series. And you can see that the slide on the left looks at the burden of disease from the point of view of both living with disability, but also mortality. And you can see that mental and neurological disorders are the fifth largest contribution to global burden uh, amongst older people after cardiovascular diseases, cancer, chronic respiratory conditions, and musculoskeletal conditions. You can see that most of the burden comes from older people living in low and middle income countries. That's the red parts of the bar. And in fact, in high income regions where chronic respiratory problems are less um, burdensome, you can actually see that mental and neurological disorders are the fourth largest contributor to burden of disease. But if one moves to the right-hand side of the slide, and this is our own data from studies in low- and middle-income countries, um, and you look at just the contribution to disability and needs for care, you see that disorders of the mind and brain are overwhelmingly the biggest contributor to disability and needs for care. Dementia number one standing out very, very clearly. Limb paralysis and weakness, that's undiagnosed stroke, is number two. Stroke is number three. And depression is number four. This is not surprising when you think about it, because the brain is such an important organ. If your heart isn't working so well, then your exercise function is limited. But if your brain capacity is good, you can structure and organize your life so you can continue to live independently, even though in a slightly limited way. So disorders of the mind and brain are hugely important. We've been working with WHO and the uh, Alzheimer's Disease International to produce a series of world Alzheimer's reports since 2009, giving a global snapshot of the prevalence, the burden of impact of dementia in different world regions. And I'm just going to give you a, a little bit of a digest of those figures. Um, first of all, these are the numbers of people living with dementia in different world regions in 2015. And you can see that in Europe, there are 7.5 million people living with dementia in 2015, out of a total, the grey bar on the bottom right, of nearly 47 million people living with dementia worldwide. Um, but now, let's scroll forward and look and see how the global situation changes through to 2050. And I think you'll see those bars in the south, the poorer nations of the planet, are increasing more rapidly um, than the northern, rich and richer countries of North America, uh, Western and Eastern Europe. You'll see that the numbers of people with dementia in Europe will have doubled to 2050 to 14 million. But the global numbers will actually have trebled from 47 million to 132 million. The numbers in East Asia will have trebled, the numbers in Africa will have quadrupled, and the numbers in Latin America will have quadrupled. Nearly two-thirds of all people living with dementia will be living in what are currently low- and middle-income countries uh, by 2050. So this is a developed world problem. It's a European problem, but it is truly a global problem as well. We've actually calculated the worldwide societal cost of dementia in healthcare, in social care, and in the unpaid contribution of family caregivers. And it amounts to nearly one trillion US dollars. That's an unimaginable sum. But if it was the economy of a country, it would be about the world's 18th largest economy, which I think is currently Saudi Arabia, close to uh, Poland. But that cost will have doubled to 2030 to two trillion US dollars. This is a global public health priority, as the current director general of the WHO confirmed, if there ever was one. What has been achieved? Just a couple of days ago, 29th of May 2017, 
the World Health Organization passed at its General Assembly a WHO Global Action Plan on Dementia, which all countries worldwide have signed up to and committed a clear set of targets and actions with indicators to make progress on preventing dementia and improving the quality of life and the quality of care for people living with dementia. So we've achieved a lot with our World Alzheimer Reports in the last few years. Everyone's using our figures. There's an acknowledgement that this is a global burden, that we can't just wait for a cure. We need to be improving care right now, and we need to use a public health approach for that, and that includes attention to possibilities for brain health promotion and dementia risk reduction. So let's look at promotion and dementia risk reduction. And here, as I think earlier speakers have noted, we need to take a life course perspective because undoubtedly the way that brains develop in the first few years of life is important in building a strong, resilient organ that even if you develop Alzheimer's disease may not lead to the signs of dementia emerging. But then in midlife, it seems that cardiovascular risk factors are important. And we also have some evidence, as we'll see in a moment, that even attending to cardiovascular risk factors in late life can actually potentially make a risk, uh, a change to your risk of developing dementia over the next few years. Here was our World Alzheimer Report from 2014. And if any of you are interested, all of these reports are available on the Alzheimer's Disease International website to download. We looked at all the evidence from all of the studies worldwide. What was the strong evidence for modifiable risk factors? Number one, education in early life. The better educated you were in the early years, the lower your risk of going on to develop dementia. Number two, high blood pressure, but in midlife. Because actually, as we get older, uh, for people who go on to develop dementia, their blood pressure level falls because they're developing dementia. So it seems that the opportunity for intervening for hypertension may be mainly in uh, midlife, but let's have another look at some more data on that in a moment. But with diabetes, diabetes in midlife and diabetes in late life, and smoking in midlife and smoking in late life increase your risk of developing dementia. There is evidence, as with lung cancer, that giving up smoking reduces your risk of going on to develop dementia as if you had never smoked. So these are important issues. There's two mechanisms. One is building a stronger and more resilient brain, so-called cognitive or brain reserve. And the other is the impact of vascular disease, cardiovascular disease, on the blood vessels to the brain and the potential to reduce that cardiovascular risk and hence uh, what is good for your heart is ultimately good for your brain. Now, are we making progress on this? Because in many high-income countries, I expect Estonia as well, there's been an improvement over the last 30 years in the cardiovascular health of the whole population. There's less smoking, blood pressure levels are going down, cholesterol levels are going down. There's more physical activity, as Tina was pointing out. Um, actually, the prevalence of obesity and diabetes is increasing. But nevertheless, in most high-income countries, we've seen a decline in the incidence of heart disease and stroke, which is great. And of course, every generation is better educated than the last. Now, if these are all risk factors for dementia, then perhaps dementia ought to be becoming less common in our populations because of these changes in these risk factors in high-income countries. However, if one looks at a middle-income country like China, there's actually evidence that the prevalence of dementia has been going up in recent years. But that wouldn't be surprising because actually cardiovascular health has been getting worse in the Chinese population with an epidemic of obesity that didn't exist before. And also you can see the alarming rise in cigarette consumption over the last 40 years. So what about Europe? What are the trends in dementia prevalence? And these are all European studies from Stockholm, uh, from Gothenburg, and from Zaragoza in Spain, and a UK study in which they've used the same study design on the same population, but they've done it more than once with an interval of time in between. So we can use these studies to understand the trend. Now, I look at that slide, and I would say there's nothing going on here. 
Uh, there's really no trend. There's one of these studies, the UK study in green line there, where there actually was a statistically significant decline in the prevalence of dementia, particularly among older ages. But I think too much has been written about this study, and what we need to do is to look at the overall picture, which is what we did uh, in the World Alzheimer Report 2015, and look at all of the studies like this around the world that have looked at the trend in dementia over time. And what we find is that there's no trend in prevalence. The prevalence of dementia does not seem to have been changing in recent years, despite that one UK study. However, the incidence of dementia, that's the number of new cases, seems to have been going down in high-income countries, which is great, and it's consistent with that improvement in education and cardiovascular health. Probably the reason why prevalence isn't going down is that at the same time the number of new cases are going down, each person who develops dementia lives for longer because their health care and social care is improving. So that's a good thing, but it probably means that policymakers don't need to get too carried away with this news about possibility for prevention because we're still going to need to be coping with increasing numbers of people living with dementia in our societies, and this is mainly driven by population aging that we heard the speaker referred to earlier. A couple of findings from our 1066 dementia research group studies in low and middle income countries, and I'm going to explain to you why we measured people's heads, why we measured people's legs, why I'm showing a picture of a classroom in the 1920s, and a lady in the Dominican Republic who's just had a blood sample taken before breakfast and is being given a nutritious drink. These are prospective, longitudinal studies designed to look at the impact of risk factors on your risk of developing dementia. And you can see there that in countries in the Caribbean, in Latin America, and in China, nearly 15,000 people took part in our study and were followed up for a three to five year period to look at who developed dementia over time and who did not. It's one of the biggest cohort studies, longitudinal studies, of dementia risk that has ever been conducted. And we confirmed in these low and middle income countries that again, um, more education means a lower risk for developing dementia. That curious figure of 0.89 means that for every increase in the level of education, your risk of developing dementia goes down by 11%. So no education to primary education, an 11% reduction. Primary education to secondary education, another 11% reduction. Secondary to tertiary, another 11% reduction. This is a powerful weapon that societies have around the school to progressively increase the education of our younger people uh, and give them brains that are maximally developed to cope with the demands of life across the life course. And in these low and middle income country studies, there was an additional independent effect of literacy, that people who had learned to read and write had a 32% lower risk of going on to develop dementia. So leg lengths are fascinating. Um, in this graph on the right, you can see the increases in adult height in different world regions. And you can see that from 1900 onwards, for the top three lines on that graph, which are North America, Western Europe, and Eastern Europe, there has been a remarkable increase in the heights of those populations. And the increase in height is because of the increase in the leg length, not in the increase mainly in the trunk length. And leg length is largely determined by nutrition in the early years of life. So we measured leg lengths, and what we found uh, was that the longer your leg, the lower the risk of developing dementia. In fact, the quarter of the older populations with the longest legs had a 20% lower risk of going on to develop dementia. Um, skull circumference didn't have an effect. Skull circumference is an index of uh, brain growth and development um, in the, again, the early years of life. So this is an important finding, that it's leg length, but not skull circumference, uh, that is important for the incidence of dementia. And this suggests that as well as education, early life nutrition 
may be a really important factor for making people resilient and their brains resilient against developing in a future dementia in the future. The other things that we've managed to show from our low and middle income countries, confirming some findings from high income countries, is that diabetes is an important risk factor, but it is uncontrolled diabetes which is where most of the additional risk is. This is an important finding because then if we can put more effort not only into preventing diabetes, but in detecting and controlling diabetes amongst people who are already old, we may then reduce their risk of going on to develop dementia. And we found exactly the same thing with hypertension, that it's not just hypertension in general, but in late life it is uncontrolled and undetected hypertension. And there is far too much uncontrolled and undetected hypertension out there. There have been a few trials in Europe looking at um, cardiovascular risk factor intervention in older people who are at risk of going on to develop dementia and its impact on their risk for cognitive decline and dementia. The most successful of these have been is the Finnish finger trial, which was an incredibly intensive two-year program um, of physical exercise, uh, dietary change, um, some of the cognitive and memory training that we heard Tina talk about um, earlier, and also efforts to control cardiovascular risk factors by identifying hypertension and diabetes and treating them. And after two years, there are already some signs that improvements in cognitive function are better in the cardiovascular risk factor intervention group than they were in the control condition. And this trial is carrying on for another three years to look and see whether this has an impact on dementia as well. The other main trial to publish so far is the PREDIVA trial from the Netherlands, and that did not show any impact of a cardiovascular risk factor intervention on the incidence of dementia over five years. But the investigators pointed out that healthcare is so good in the Netherlands, as far as cardiovascular risk factors are concerned, that they found it very difficult to improve it in the trial. So they were able to improve hypertension control a bit, but they weren't able to improve diabetes control already. It was so good. If we look at some of the low and middle income countries where we'd be working in our 1066 dementia research group, you can see that column on the right, that the proportion of all people in the population who have their hypertension both detected and controlled is very low in a lot of these settings. Every country, including here in Estonia, I hope, we need to be tracking this because detecting and controlling hypertension is basically simple at the public health level. You need a sphygmomanometer, you need people to be checked regularly, and the drug treatments are very cheap and generally available. So the message about dementia and cognitive decline for older people must be, this is a preventable condition. We need to add this to heart disease, stroke, and cancer, and say that public health action can make a difference. And so we need to be doing something about this. We need to bust myths. Dementia is not an inevitable normal part of aging. It is not the case that there is nothing that we can do. And it's everybody's business. It's young people's business because brain health promotion can never start too early. We shouldn't be taking up smoking. We should be stopping smoking if we're doing it. We should get our health checked, our blood pressure level focused. And it's never too late to do something about it either. So older people, even people with cognitive frailty, can make changes in their lifestyles. Um, this may slow, but it will not stop the epidemic of dementia. I'm going to change set slightly now. We've been talking about brain health, cognitive function, and dementia. Now we're going to be talking about depression amongst older people. But as we'll see in a moment, I think these two issues are very much linked, and both brain function, cognitive function, dementia, and depression are linked to the whole body, holistically, and physical health as well. And I'm going to be talking about some European studies that I've been involved with, the Eurodep study, the SHARE study in the early days, and also uh, a couple of bits of data uh, internationally from our 1066 Dementia Research Group studies. The first thing is that there's a strong case that depression in older people is actually a bit different 
from depression in younger people. There's no cutoff, but it just sort of evolves and changes over time. In older people, it's often the first time that they've been significantly depressed in their lives. Um, unfortunately, younger people who have repeated episodes of severe depression, there's a big effect on life expectancy, and not many of them actually live through to late life. So older people need new reasons and new risk factors for becoming depressed. And the other thing is that the symptom profile changes in older people. So symptoms of depression go up with increasing age in older people, but it's symptoms of what we call low motivation on the right there. Loss of interest in things, loss of enjoyment, loss of concentration. It's not the real low mood, effective suffering symptoms of I'm depressed and I'm sad, I cry all the time, life is so bad, I don't want to live, I feel guilty all the time. It's not those so much, it's the low motivation symptoms. And that suggests a possible link with brain aging and or possibly restricted social opportunities, opportunities for social participation. Here's a study I was involved in, a community-based study in London, looking at the social etiology of depression. So what social factors predict which older people go on to develop depression over a one-year period? And I called this slide at the time, uh, and this is very kind of uh, over-assertive for a scientist, the cause of late-life depression, participation restriction. But there's been a lot of data that has emerged since then confirming this incredibly strong association between what we call then handicap, what we would call now participation restriction, having difficulties in getting involved and engaged in the social life of your family and your community because of underlying health conditions. You can see here that people in the most handicapped quarter of the Gospel Oak population were five times more likely than people in the least handicapped quarter to develop a serious episode of depression over one year. The population attributable fraction at the bottom, 70%, that would mean if you could remove participation restriction from this population, you would avoid 70% of the new cases of depression uh, within that population. Here you can see the pathways. First of all, for moving from being well to becoming depressed, it's around having a health condition, which leads to disability and activity limitation. But of course, disability and activity limitation need not necessarily mean that your ability to participate in the life of your community is impaired. But for those people who couldn't participate in the life of their community, the risk for developing depression was increased. And having less contact with friends um, added even further to that risk. For being depressed and then recovering, uh, those that recovered were more likely to engage in social activity and were more likely to receive social support. So this suggests that a goal for community prevention of late-life depression is to look at the mechanisms by which the physical and social fabric of the community as a whole limits social participation. And this is one that we found in Gospel Oak. This was a new security door in a block of flats that was five centimeters thick and made of solid steel. And we found older people living in that block who'd actually had to stop going out when this security door was installed by unthinking people who were not considering the whole range of people living in that block, including older people who were frail. And you can see the environment around that door is one which would not be welcoming um, and would not encourage older people to come out of the block and go into the block. The block itself became a prison, and there we can see the block. Um, and in fact, the housing policy of the local authority at that time put older people in supported living in the top four floors of this block. But the lifts often didn't work, and so again, they were literally imprisoned um, in the setting where we were. So to prevent older people's depression, we need age-friendly communities, as the WHO says. And this is more than the quality of housing. It's more than the built environment and the local environment, although those are really important. It's about inclusive public transport, 
Uh, it's about encouraging social participation. It's about respect and social inclusion. This is the way that the impact of disability can be mitigated. My mother, who is 89 and frail and had to give up driving last year because of memory and concentration problems and vision problems, went on a holiday last week to Wales with a bus trip with other older people, with a company that provides support for older people to do this. And she went on her own, and she went up to the top of the second highest mountain in the United Kingdom when she was there. No, she didn't walk up there, she went on the train. But she did it, and she did this independently. And she was pleased and proud, and it motivated her. And she came back home invigorated after that. The other thing that is important for depression with older people is social protection. And we've had the minister here uh, talking to us about this, this issue. You have strong social protection here in Estonia, as we do in many European countries. But social protection is a complex thing made up of many interactive parts. In an earlier wave of the SHARE study, looking at the prevalence of depression amongst older people across Europe, you can see that it was very similar for many of the, other, many of the countries, except for France, Italy, Spain, and to an extent Greece, where in all of those countries there was a much higher prevalence. Um, it wasn't a, a measurement artifact, we looked at that. It wasn't accounted for by differences in the age, the gender, the education, or the cognition. Was it culture? Was it a Latin effect? Or perhaps it was about weaker social protection, an over-reliance on the family to provide social protection for older adults in that country, in those countries, and less of a safety net provided by the state. And these are data from our low- and middle-income countries showing how this might break down. Um, we can see here in the red bars the income support from the family. Sorry, uh, the red bar is the government pension, and the pink bar is income from family support. And you see that Cuba has very good pensions from the government, and so the family doesn't need to provide much support. Dominican Republic next door to it has very few pensions, very low pension coverage, and so the role of the family is much more important. And the role of the family in India and in rural China on the right is also very important. Well, having an important role for the family is fine if you have them. But you can see here the proportion of, pe of older people without children available to support them. And you can see that this can be sometimes surprisingly high. It's as high uh, as over 20% in the Dominican Republic. And that's both because of the white part of the bar, which is infertility, that you've never had children or you've not been married, but it's also, particularly for Dominican Republic, children migrating away to the USA. They can send you money, but they can't be there to provide you with personal care. And you can see how this relates to extreme poverty, food insecurity in those countries. And Dominican Republic and India, which are shaky, both from the point of view of pensions and also the informal support by family members, poverty, food insecurity amongst older people is distressingly common. And we can see that many of these factors are risk factors for late life depression. Having less wealth, um, having food insecurity, um, as well as physical impairments are risk factors for going on to develop depression in these sites. And we can see actually when we look at the prevalence of depression in these countries that the countries with the weakest social protection, that's the Dominican Republic and India um, and rural Mexico as well, seem to have the highest prevalences of depression in older people. Um, so social protection is a complex thing. Family support can compensate in traditional societies, but family support is weakening. Social pensions provide a safety net. And worldwide, it's going to be important for governments and states to provide much more effective and comprehensive uh, support nets for older people. So finally, we've just got a couple of minutes, I wanted to talk about care for older people, which is an area that I'm particularly passionate about and work that we've been doing with WHO in Geneva to look at a basic public health model for providing integrated care in primary care in the community. So it needs to be integrated into primary care. There needs to be integration between health and social care. It needs to be task shifting, and this is where health promoters like you come in. 
Um, specialists are not sufficient to provide all of the support to prevent and manage dementia and depression amongst older people in the community. We need to use non-specialists supported by specialist services. And we need to reduce barriers by going out to frail older people who need care in their own homes. And we need to make it simple. And this is what the WHO Integrated Care for Older People program that I've been developing with them over the last few years focuses on. It isn't condition specific. There's not one program for dementia, one program for stroke. Instead, we focus on frail and dependent older people who have a lot of comorbidity anyway. And we look at things not at the level of diagnoses, but at the level of impairments. These would be the things that as health promoters you would notice. Confusion, low mood, immobility, incontinence, undernutrition, uh, hearing and vision problems, and carer knowledge and strain. And so here are people like you, health promoters in India, rural India, in Goa, who we trained out to carry out simple assessments to identify frail and dependent older people in the community, identify which impairments were problematic, and then to begin to deliver simple evidence-based interventions. Multimorbidity, frailty, and dependence interact with each other. We think that the target should be on the frail and vulnerable for developing needs for care and those older people who've already developed needs for care who account for about 15% of the older population in these societies. You can see that that target population, low mood and cognition impairment are amongst the two most common impairments along with low mobility, but the other impairments are important as well. And if one looks at the interaction between low mood and cognitive impairment, in many of these target populations in those countries, 80% or more of the target population has either low mood or low cognition or both. And the black bit in the middle is the comorbidity between low mood and low cognition, which is very common. So we need interventions that are simple for non-specialist health workers in the community to deliver in older people's homes that can simultaneously address the low cognition problem and address the low mood problem. Antidepressants are good for clinical depression, but they're not good for low depression uh, levels, subsyndromal depression. They don't work for depression in dementia, and they don't do anything to improve cognition in dementia. Psychological interventions, like problem solving, are good for depression and subsyndromal depression, but not good in the context of dementia. They're too complex. Cognitive stimulation and memory training perhaps help cognition in dementia, but they don't do anything for low mood. Behavioral activation is good for clinical depression, good for low levels of depression symptoms, good for depression in dementia, and quite possibly helps with cognition in dementia as well. It's very simple and it's very intuitive. It's person-centered because it reflects the values and preferences of the older person. What are the things that you used to find pleasurable but you've stopped doing? Well, perhaps you can try and do them to a lesser degree or you can try and do them in a different way that will enable you to engage again. It focuses on social participation and engaging possibilities for social communication and social engagement with others. It's feasible to be delivered by non-specialists. I think this is exactly the type of intervention that we need to be focusing on in order to improve quality of life, well-being, and mental well-being amongst frail and dependent older people in the community. So there I end, and there's a long list of thanks, which I won't read out, um, but I really have depended on a lot of sources and a lot of colleagues uh, for the content of this work. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.